Okay. You walk in, I've never <laughs> seen them. <before. laughs> Everything in there, just like you. What do you mean? You go in, you fly. Because it's like, you're like let me do that. Hello, my name is Alexandra Leon with the Samuel Proctor Oral History Program. Today is July 26, 2022, and I am interviewing at Holly Springs, Mississippi. I'm here today interviewing with Christian Cassell and Patrick Gray. And today we will be interviewing Mr. Wayne Jones. So Mr. Jones, could you please tell us about your childhood, your early upbringing, and your date of birth, your birth? Okay, I was originally born in South Jersey, a town called Pensgrove, New Jersey. I was born April 30th, 1957. Okay, I was, I was raised in South Jersey. And I, I, was, I went to uh, Pensgrove High School, and I stayed there until I was 18. I joined the United States Marine Corps at 18, spent almost four years in the Marine Corps from 1975 to 1979. I got out of the Marine Corps, came back to South Jersey, uh, got a degree in electronics instrumentation technology from Salem Community College, went to NJIT, which is the New Jersey Institute of Technology in Newark, New Jersey, also known as the College of, uh, Newark College of Engineering. I graduated from there in 1989. Uh, I got married in 1987 to my wife. She's interviewing in the next room. Uh, we moved to, we, well, I spent probably most of my life in New Jersey. And when I was about 48, we moved to California because I lost a job and that was the only place I could find. <laughs> yeah, but it, that, that didn't work out because we never really liked living in California. I don't know if anybody's from there or not, but it just wasn't for us. It's, uh, the cost of living is exorbitant and yeah, the traffic is horrible. So then we moved to uh, Mississippi, to Holly Springs, Mississippi in uh, 2005, and we've been living here since 2005 in Holly Springs, Mississippi. And we like North Mississippi, and we like living here. Does that answer your question? Uh, could you talk a little bit about your parents and what they did? Oh, uh, my family, uh, my mother's family and my father's family are originally from uh, King and Queen County, Virginia, are the commonly known, I didn't forgot the name of the, what they call it, uh, tide water down there, but it's anyways, King and King County, Virginia. And they both, uh, my both sides of my parents, they come from the same area in Virginia. And most of the people in South Jersey where I grew up at came from that area. They come up to Woodstown, New Jersey, or North Yorktown, New Jersey, or that Salem County area. A lot of the people came from that area along the Tappahanna uh, River in, in Maryland and Virginia area. And so most of my mother's family and my father's family, their friends and their uh, relatives came from that area. And so they formed a community in South Jersey. And my mother's family and my father's family, uh, they started, they were instrumental in, at the Morning Star Baptist Church in Woodstown, New Jersey. Uh, they, it, got, it got started and uh, they were, uh, both families were there. Uh, my mother and father's family, my mother's family had 11 children. My father's family, I think it was uh, six or, yeah, six, six children. Uh, my mother is still, my mother is still alive. My father passed in, uh, five years ago. And uh, let me see, what, oh, uh, my, my mother uh, was a laborer. Uh, she worked at different factory jobs all her life very bright woman, she can just about do anything, but didn't have the opportunity. My father was a United States Air Force veteran. 
he did, uh, I believe it was eight years in the Air Force, uh, but he wound up uh, working, uh, he worked at DuPont's and Getty Oil in the area and other uh, jobs when he got out, but uh, he, he, he wanted to, he wanted to be a lawyer at one time and wanted to do other things, but those opportunities weren't necessarily open to African Americans at that period in time. But they raised their family and they, they, they stuck with family and I was always raised around family when I was younger. Mr. Jones, could you please elaborate more on your experience in the armed forces, uh, like the Marine Corps? Uh, well, I went to Paris Island in 1975, September 17th, 1975, to, uh, to remember exactly. And it was an experience because I had, I had never left home. Well, I did go to Kansas City once, but that was with my oldest brother. But I had never left home and been on my own until I went in the Marine Corps. And when I went in the Marine Corps, I found out that everyone wasn't raised like I was raised. I was raised to be respectful, to say yes, sir, and no, ma'am, and to be polite and to be respectful of other people's feelings. You know, all a little, I don't know if you guys got, but on your report card, they always gave you when I was coming up, uh, how well you get along with others, how well you play with others, things like that. We were graded on, you know, you, you got S's or U's uh, and those things. So when I joined the Marine Corps, I find out that Everybody doesn't say yes, sir, and no, ma'am. Everybody doesn't flush the toilet after they use it. Everybody doesn't say excuse me if they walk in front of you. And, and, and people can be, uh, not because they weren't taught or anything, but they can be rude and uh, impolite, just naturally. And that was a big shock for me when I got, you know, when I joined the, when I joined the service. And I stayed, I, I, I was in the Marine Corps, I was in the reserves initially, then I signed up to do three years because I didn't know whether I was going to like it or not. And I could have stayed in the military till I found, until I liked being in uniform and the military structure and everything. I mean, my uniform was always starched and my boots were always polished and I could do my job. I was a field radio operator, but I wanted to go to engineering school. But uh, it was 1977, and I was in Okinawa, Japan, and I couldn't figure out why I couldn't get promoted. But the re and it, it, it and I was you know just thinking about it because I was doing everything that I thought I should do, and I remember distinctly, uh, 1977. There were, you know, the platoons were integrated. And so there were black, black folks, whites, Mexicans, Asians, everybody. But uh, people weren't being people weren't being promoted on a on a on a diverse scale, so to so to speak, to represent everyone. And I couldn't figure out why I couldn't be promoted. And I was laying in Iraq one night, and it just occurred to me: the reason you're not being promoted is is because you're black. And that was a awakening because. To realize, see, I wasn't raised a certain way. We were raised to accept everyone, accept everybody. We knew we were black, but we didn't know what it meant to be quote unquote African American in America as defined by us. You know, popular culture told you, but not, just, you know, not, that's not necessarily in your best interest what popular culture teaches you. So I'm 19 years old and I realize that and I say to myself, well, what can I do about that? I can't do anything about that. So that's when I realized that I had to get out of the Marine Corps because that was my first reaction because I wasn't going to stay in this environment and try to make a career out of this. When you have people over you in an official capacity and you have to follow orders, it's easy to run into someone who is prejudiced, racist or otherwise, who doesn't like you for whatever reason. And so that's when I decided that I would get out when my time was up and I didn't stay in. But I could have easily did 20 years if I, because I liked it, but I just didn't like the fact that 
I was going to have to put up with. You know, little did I know at that time that, this, the, that you know, I, you, you come to the conclusion eventually that the military is only a microcosm of the society. Um, I just wanted to ask, were there specific instances you remember of being discriminated against in the Marine Corps? Uh, y y yes, and I'll, I'll tell you, I'll, t I'll tell you what, you, see, I was a, a different kind of person. I was, I was raised a different way. I can walk into, I can walk into a room, uh, and there's, there's plenty of people like me, but if you're not raised a certain way, children should be seen and not heard. Uh, we were very respectful when we were young. What that translates to is that I can walk into a room, any room, and not be noticed if I don't want to be noticed. You would even not know I was there unless I tell you, and then you'll remember I was there, but you would forget I was there. So. And I say that to say, when they were, when uh, other guys, other African Americans and uh, people weren't getting promoted, they would always argue. And I heard these arguments, and it was always, well, how come y'all don't promote Jones? Jones do everything you say. He do everything you ask him to do, and you still won't. You know, you don't promote him. And they were like. Well, who's Jones? They didn't even know, they didn't even realize that I was in the platoon, that I existed. Because I was just my, my personality and everything, it was just, it's like non-offensive, non-threatening, but I was raised that way. And, but you don't realize this until you get older. So, as far as incidents are concerned, those are the, you know, it's, it's those kinds of things that happen. It's not necessarily, I mean, just a whole, it, it, there's a whole lot of folks that were, you know, black that didn't get promoted or, uh, you know, that there's some did, but it's, it's just not, it wasn't fair. I'll put it that way. I know life isn't fair, but there was discrimination. Does that answer your question? I think so, yeah. uh, this is Patrick again. Um, Mr. Jones, uh, you keep mentioning um, the differences between pe uh, how people are raised. Did you notice any difference uh, in how people were raised? Uh, between the places you moved in, so uh, from New East Coast to West Coast, North and South, um, were there any differences in people? Uh, there are differences uh, demographically. People have different experiences in different parts of the country. You know, uh, wh wh whether you're raised in on the East Coast or the West Coast or down South, there, it's culturally different all across the country, even though, it's quote unquote, it's one country, it's not one culture. You know, even though, yes, there are apple pie and there is McDonald's and there's Coke everywhere, but there's still not, it's still not one culture in this country. So there are differences now. Specific differences? See, I was, I was only raised in South Jersey. I only know that as my experience in uh, my our child, she was raised in South Jersey, and she went. She only did one year of school in California, so I can't give you specific differences in how children were raised or anything. But it is different. Um, I wanted to ask, what was it like being in the Marine Corps at the tail end and after Vietnam? Well, that's the reason. The one of the reasons I joined the Marine Corps in 1975 is because the country had just got out of the Vietnam War, and I realized that the potential for going back to war, to actually taking a chance on actually being in combat, were very nil. And that's, you know, from my perspective, as from an 18-year-old, that, that was a good decision. Now, at 18, you know, I'm not, I'm, don't take this personally, but I'm 65 now. I realized that I didn't know anything at 18, okay? And so that logic n didn't necessarily have to be true. It just turned out that way that there was no conflict or any war to send, you know, in, from 70. I didn't, uh, I didn't go on the med cruise in 76 that there were some guys that were involved in the Iran hostage situation. I wasn't, I wasn't involved in any of that. 
So I never, I, uh, I've never seen any quote unquote combat, so to speak, nor do I want to. Um, this is Alexandra. How did that experience with prejudice in the, the Marine Corps, like how did that, how did you carry that with you after you left? Uh, you just, it's just a fact of life. You, you can't let people, you can't let how other people uh, treat you or feel about you affect your everyday uh, life and how you are going to interact in life itself. Now, you have to come to that realization. You have to realize that. You have to realize that you actually have power over how you react. You can't act, you can't, uh, has the word, I can't. When you instruct children, you can influence children when they're young. But when it comes to adults, the most uh, influential uh, effect is other people, socially. Human beings are social. They gather in groups and groups come together and make decisions in the best interest of the group. So, but other, other groups do other things. So you can't let, you know, it's, this is, this goes into psychology and groups and things like that, but you can't let, you can't be so, uh, you have to learn this, affected by how other people treat you to the point where you always find yourself in a reacting situation rather than an acting situation, which is in your own best interest. Cause that just leaves you distraught and confused. Uh, this is Christian. I was hoping you can give us uh, kind of an overview of the work you've done for civil rights advocacy and social advocacy throughout your life. Oh, well, that started when I got, that started when I got older. Uh, I was, you know, I was, I, like I said, I was born in 1957. So in 1967, I'm only 10 years old. I graduated from high school in 1975 at 18. Uh, I mean, we, I grew up watching the civil rights quote era on TV. I, you know, I remember when Martin Luther King was assassinated, when Malcolm X was assassinated, when Megger Evans was assassinated, things like that. I remember the rebellions in Newark, in Chicago, in Detroit, commonly known then as riots. So I never got involved in because when we weren't quote unquote taught any quote unquote you know, African American history or any history but what was taught in in the schools in common. So, you know, we weren't defining that era for ourselves. Even the term civil rights is questionable as a definition for the era as opposed to human rights. So, See, but I have to get older to be able to begin to define this for myself. So that starts when I start, after I begin to learn history and have an understanding of how important history is and the history of this country, the history of your, your personal, your family, and how that history in the country and in the environment affects the people in the area that you are in, as well as your environment, your cultural milieu, so to speak. And so you have to begin to understand that before you can actually, I did anyway, before I actually take an active role in the participation of uh, self-determination. This is Alexandra again. You mentioned earlier that your parents were involved with the Morning Star Baptist Church. And mm -hmm. how did that, watching your parents partake in these activities, how did that influence your activism later on in your life? Oh, well, that's, I uh, see, we were always, we were taught, uh, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. The golden rule was in the house. Uh, I went to church every Sunday. I went to Sunday school. We went to Sunday school every Sunday that I can remember. I never read the Bible from cover to cover, but I sit in, I know just about all the Sunday school lessons, if I can remember them all, that anybody else would know. So we were active in that, and we were always taught to do the right thing, to do that which is right, you know, don't lie, 
don't cheat, don't steal, be honest, do what's right, be respectful of others, respect your elders, the whole, you know, all that. The only thing is, and it's, it's, good prepara it's good preparation for life, but what you don't get told is not everybody goes by that. And you don't get told how to, how, you know, how to navigate that when it, when it doesn't, you know, when not everybody functions that way. So. This is Patrick again. Um, Mr. Jones. Uh, could you speak uh, more about your education uh, growing up? Um, yeah, growing up. Yeah, I went to, uh, I went, I went to kindergarten in South Jersey in Pensgrove. I went to Persian and Lafayette schools. Uh, I went to more schools in the area than my brother and sisters did because I went to Broad Street School, then I went to Carlton School, then I went to the middle school, then I went to the high school. I went to all the schools in the area except St. James High School at the time because I started, I got moved around. So, and uh, the education, in, I mean, it was, it wasn't, it wasn't the worst education. It wasn't the best education either. Because when I got ready to, I always wanted to be an engineer. And when I got ready to go to engineering school, I go to engineering school, and I find out, as mo if any of you are engineers, that you have to have, uh, you know two or three years of practice in calculus before you can begin engineering. And if you don't have it, you can read all the books that you want, understand all the theory that you want, because I did all this, but I couldn't do the work as far as the math is concerned. And when it comes to the math and engineering, that's how they, that's how they tell you, okay, this is how we know you understand the work, because you can do the math. And I couldn't do the math. And I would sit in the professor's office the first time it happened, and all my answers on the paper were correct. And he would ask me, he says, how did you, he said, how do I know that you did this? That you, I said, I read the book. You know, I understood what I read. I said, those answers, this is multiple choice. There's two of those answers for every question that don't make any sense. I don't, I'm not going to, you know, I picked the one that, that this is, this doesn't agree with that. So that has to be the answer. He says, yes, but that's, he says, he says, well, I can see that, but I don't know how you figured this out. You can't, you don't show me any of your work. I said, I got the right answer. And I'm arguing with the man. He says, you have to show your work. I didn't understand that. See, as far as I'm concerned, if I, if I come up with the right answer, I was right. What does it you know how how you got that answer see but you don't you 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 begin to understand these things and then you understand okay i had to go back get the calculus book out learn all the algebra learn all the, i had trigger not geometry but not trig so i had to learn all the formulas do all that on my own and then i was able to get through engineering school because i was able to show my work but the, with that but that's only one way to learn engineering that's the way that's, pop. there's other ways, but how they grade you when you're in the school, that's, that's the way it is. You have to conform. So anyway, that was that experience. Did I answer your question? Uh, this is Christian. I wanted to know what it was like growing up, you know, in the 60s and late, early 70s, a very politically charged time in America. Were your, was your community very aware of that? Were your parents very active in talking to you guys about stuff like that? No, uh, nobody talked. We saw it on TV. Nobody talked to us about it. I can remember the conversations I had with my mother and most black, most uh, African Americans get this conversation at one time or another where she showed us, she told us basically, you already got two strikes against you because you're black. And so you have to be better than everybody else. That's a common thread if you ask anybody. Uh, most, and it's not all black folks, because like I said, people in the cult in this country are raised differently culturally. But most black folks, if you ask them, they will tell you that they had some kind of conversation with their parents about that. So there was no, you know, there was no education about what was going on as far as the 60s and the 70s. The, you know. 
the Vietnam War was going on in the 60s. At the 6 o'clock news, what I saw on TV was people in body bags. I mean, you know, they were, they showed it on TV for the first time. People with, you know, blood and guts everywhere. At, and you're, you're eating dinner and you see this on a black and white TV because the color TV really hadn't come out at that time. And you see this. And when I was in grade school, it seemed like every week, Somebody, somebody's older brother was dying in Vietnam. This was in 63 through 65. And I mean, to me, you would, you know, somebody, a child would be out of school because their older brother, you know, died in Vietnam somewhere. And it was like every, and it was like at least, it seemed like every week or twice a month, something like that. And it was just, you had no idea at that age what was going on, but that specter was always there as you're growing up and you're getting older and you're thinking, and you know, you get 13, 14, and 15 and you start to think, well, am I gonna have to go to Vietnam? And so when the war is over in 74, that's like a relief because I'm still a junior in high school. This is Alexandra. You mentioned earlier about your experiences with trigonometry and mathematics and this cookie cutter curriculum that they have. You know, there's different ways to learn, but they only want you to follow it a certain way. And you also mentioned how people are raised differently and there's so many different cultures. How do you think the education system can improve today to ensure everyone <laughs> has to respect everybody. Okay, well, I'm a, it's gonna be on film anyway. I'm just gonna be honest. Okay, uh, the culture, the, the culture of education in general, see, education of a society should be for the, the, the benefit of the entire society, not just a few. And it goes back to the origins of how the country was started. When this country was started, uh, women couldn't vote, African Americans couldn't vote, uh, and nobody else could vote. It was started for, quote unquote, property, property owners, particularly white men who had money. And, and because they owned property and had money, the country was for them. It wasn't even for everybody white, so to speak. No, if you didn't have own property, you weren't supposed to, you know, have a say in the country and the government and everything. But yet, it was necessary for you uh, to lend your uh, your will and your intent personally for the American Revolution to defeat the enemy. See, but so so things come together. But to answer your question, uh, education. There has to, I think there has to be a national educational policy in this country that benefits the education for everyone that you're going to tell the story that's going to be beneficial to everybody. I mean, this argument over critical race theory is ridiculous when nobody really, I mean, you can understand what it is, but you got people that are talking about it and they have no idea what it is. And it's not, it's not even taught. I mean, it's just, it's a theory, and most folks, they don't even know what, unfortunately, I should, well, you got to understand what the word theory means, first of all, and so, but you, people are arguing about things, and it doesn't make any sense. So, to answer your question, there has to be an educational policy, I think, created at the state level and the national level that we're going to, you know, teach things in our public schools and in and even in the private schools that are going to be beneficial for the entire society and not just a few you can't you know ignorance is bliss and you can't have you can't have people so ignorant that they follow people who are detrimental to themselves and each other i mean and donald trump is a perfect example i mean the man is uh, a reprobate, in, in, in my estimation, personally, because he cares for nobody but himself, period. I mean, that type of person is not worthy of any leadership position anywhere. 
and for anything, for any reason. I mean, that's just my opinion. I mean, but but you have to you have to come to that at your own you know your own level of fruition because not everybody has the same experience, and so you know and the wherewithal to understand that. Sir, uh, this is Patrick again. Um, on that note, uh, how could we teach history uh, nowadays in order to really give a whole picture to everybody? As you mentioned before, uh, ignorance is bliss um, for a lot of people, so they don't really have any experience learning uh, about a lot of the dark history in our country. And so sometimes they, don't, uh, they just don't see it or they just don't believe it. So how could we teach history in a way that can really benefit everybody? Okay, so the elephant in the room is, first of all, is race. And very few people know how to, quote unquote, discuss race. First of all, the, even the, the fact that race is not scientific, <laughs> it's just the construct that people come up with for the benefit of themselves. And then, you know, you fill out these applications, you did it when you got in the car, you know, what race are you, what job, you, and you know, and, and what difference, I mean, uh, what difference does it, does it really make? Now, the culture, yes, but racially, the differences amongst people, people have been on the earth since time immemorial. There's always been, you know, influx with different groups and different peoples, but yet there's also this uh, idea that, you know, because there are differences in people, but genetically, genetically, the differences are, they're just finding out, you know, basically what the differences are genetically. So one of the ways here in Holly Springs is how we do this, is we, I'm involved in an organization called Gracing the Table. It's also uh, it's based on uh, another organization called Coming to the Table. And we have conversations about race, about how to talk about race, how to identify race. And we include the history in that as a subject matter so that we can, so that we, for people who want to understand uh, about, you know, how, what race is and how to get along better so that people can achieve things in a society that's necessary. If you have a, if you have a certain fun a group of people in your society that aren't functioning to the best of their ability, it's just like a four wheels on a car and one of the wheels has a flat. The ride is going to be a little, it's going to be, a, it's not going to be efficient. So it's the same thing. It comes the same thing with if you don't educate all your people. You have to educate, you know, as many, the majority are to the best of your ability the greatest for the greatest good. So we begin these discussions around race and history using the uh, history here of Holly Springs. We focus primarily on African American history because it's not known. It's been, it's been neglected and so, and because it's not known people, it's a myth that, that basically, well, Africa has no history. Africans didn't do anything. Therefore, African Americans do, didn't do anything. And so-called African history starts with slavery in this country. And that's not true. That's so far from the truth. So having those conversations about race and introducing this history, but you, but you have to know how to have the conversation because you're going to run into conflicts with people who don't understand, who don't know the history, who have been taught something completely different. So you have to allow them to create an environment so they feel safe to express themselves so that they can learn. But it's only for those who want to learn. You can't make allowances for people that quote unquote, want to remain as they are. You're not gonna get everybody. This, I have no illusions. There are gonna be people who are gonna die believing what they're gonna believe, you know, and that's just the way it is. But I, I hope I answered. I mean, it's a long, it's a complicated question, man. It's not easy. This is Alexandra. And what would you say is the most meaningful part of your work with gracing the table and coming to the table? Uh, for gracing the table is 
realize, getting folks to realize that working together, uh, coming together to solve our problems. Hum again, human beings are social, and human beings always come together to solve their problems. This is how, quote unquote, tribes get formed, or towns get formed, or countries get formed, because we realize that you can achieve more working together, whether you're hunting, or you're trying to grab, gather food to eat, or grow food, you know, or what, you know, you get more working together and more people benefit from it than not. So now as society grows, you get groups that want to benefit and nations that want to benefit. But the more you work together, the better off it is. So getting people to understand on the local level that all politics is local and the relationships among people the country wouldn't, this country wouldn't be in the position it is today, in my opinion, if local, locally uh, politics, like they took civics out of, this, out of this, the educational process, basically. People don't understand the basic things about how your local government works, about how decisions are made. You know, when money comes from Washington, D.C., that the people that you elect have a big effect on how that money gets distributed. And very few people understand that. So you have to start locally on a local level, uh, getting people to understand how to work together. So that's what I'm most proud of as far as gracing the table. And the North Mississippi Roots and Wings is another organization I'm involved in. Um, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about you know the groups that you've worked with and the events that you've been a part of throughout your life in advocacy for, for human rights. Uh, the, the basically, the, the groups that I've worked with are groups that uh, we've started. Like we, when I was in New Jersey, we started a Saturday school program. Uh, education is important. African American children don't get to learn. I mean, I I got nothing about African Americans' uh, history and culture. I mean, I lived it, but I didn't get. It wasn't taught in school, and it wasn't important. So we started a Saturday pro, a Saturday school program, you know, for children just in the neighborhood. And doing that, and we've started everywhere, you know, once everywhere that uh, I, we lived and still, until we come here in 2005, I couldn't get anybody interested in that, but my daughter was, grad, she only had one year of high school left and seen, it was our senior year. So that, and then I, I got involved. I'm always working with people to work together as far as African-American history is concerned and to be able to tell that story and to understand the story and, and the history and the culture and, so, and to make it known that uh, if not for the African American that were in this country from the beginning when it started, the country wouldn't be what it is today because I'm not, other, you know, other folks were involved, but it was the, it was the challenge of quote unquote enslavement that produced the you know the the thirteenth, fourteenth and fifteenth amendment and make the constitution real as opposed to, you know, we hold these truths to be self evident that all men are created equal. Those are words. That's not that's that's not anything. You have to make that real. And the only way you make it real is by the relationships that you have with people and people have to degree how are we going to make this real? You, it, it is what you, this life is what you make it. It's not, you know, if you, if you choose not to participate, it's what's going, it, it's what somebody else is going to make it. So did I answer your question? I think so, yeah. I wanted to follow up on whether, were there major challenges that you faced trying to, you know, work with these programs and teach black students this? Yeah, there's always the there's there's always the challenge that folks that people don't you know that people don't understand. See, I haven't. You know, don't get me wrong. I, like I said, I didn't start out knowing this. 
I, you know, I go to NJIT and I wind up going over to Harlem, which is very close. New York and North New Jersey are very close. And they have all these educational lectures on Saturdays and Sundays that I spend hours in on Saturday afternoon or just about all day Saturday where we hear people talk about African-American history, African-American culture. And I, this went on for years, you know, from, I, I do this from like 84 through 85, and you get the kind of education that you can't, that you can't get at most universities, and it's free. And so I'm reading these books and I'm learning this. I don't, so I don't pick up on any of this until I'm, you know, 28 or 30. And so then the difficulty becomes is how do you communicate in a society this knowledge that is not common knowledge that when people are told black, white, or indifferent, it doesn't make, it doesn't make a difference whether you come from India, Asia, or Mexico. It doesn't make a difference. You don't know anything about quote unquote African Americans. If you do know anything, Africa didn't have any history and they made no contributions to the world. That's basically what you, so when you start talking about these things, you're going to get pushback because people are going to say, wait a minute, that's not what I learned. That's not what I heard. You know, what about this? What about that? And you look at all the, all the so-called uh, philosophers, you know, Kant and Hume, and I forget the other ones now, but basically, they, you know, they said the same thing. And that popular, that popular narrative is what gets taught in the, in, you know, in the society, in the, co in the colleges, in the universities. I mean, after 1865, if you go back and read some of the books that come out of Cambridge or Yale or Harvard, what the people were saying, they didn't expect African Americans to survive the turn of the century. They predicted that basically these, the, the ex-slaves would die out, and they didn't. And so it became, a, it, you know, nobody addressed it. it. How do you integrate an entire people in a society that you said this about them and you find out that, well, basically what they said about them wasn't true. And so you got to go back and, well, and, and then naturally people are going to question you. Well, okay, if that wasn't true, somebody's going to ask, well, what else wasn't true? You know, and you, you, it, it overturns, it opens up a can of worms and it becomes difficult. So, I, you know, so there are difficulties in bringing these facts to light, and especially now when people are, I mean, never in my wildest dreams did, did the, the term alternative facts, I mean, I come up, well, I was taught theory in science school. I remember being in grade school in first grade when President Kennedy, they announced that, you know, we're going to the moon. And they start the science and math programs in grade schools. I'm in the, I'm like in the second grade. So it's no wonder I'm an engineer because I got all this, you know, they flooded all this information about the solar system and science and computers and the schools and the math and everything. And so you get a whole generation of people that come up like this. So, and it talks about facts and theory and science. And then you turn around in 2000 and, and, and 12, 2020, and people start talking about alternative facts. Yeah, that's crazy. I mean, how was that even, how, how do you even turn, how do you even come up with a term like that when you have a whole generation that, you know, that they, 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 they comes through this and for a lot, yeah, so that's my perspective of it, you know, things like that where, you know, facts don't matter and are, you, well, it depends on which facts you look at. No, no, no. Facts are facts and they've always been facts. And I was taught that, you know, and, and facts stay facts until theoretically you can prove otherwise. This is Alexandra. So you mentioned that 
through your grade school experience, you had a lot of facts about space and all of this new information coming. Did you have any influential figures in your educational journey, any teacher who really inspired you to become an engineer? Um, not, to, not to inspire me to become an engineer. See, I always like to take things apart. I always like to understand how things work. So when I was about eight years old, or you know, my, when we come up, you could leave your children at home and it wasn't quote unquote abusive. So I spent a lot of time in the summer times out of school at home, my brother and my sister and I by myself. So uh, my father had tools and he came home one day and we had took the entire lawnmower apart. Yeah, and I thought I could get it back together before he got home, but I couldn't. But, we, but you know, when you start using wrenches and ratchets, you can unscrew everything. And so we just kept taking screws out and we had taken the thing apart, even engine parts. So we said, okay, that's time to put this back together. And I didn't know how to put it back together. So we pushed it back underneath the tarp he had outside in the little, you know, in the, in the, uh, the, the space he had for it to go. And we waited frightfully until the day he went out to cut the grass. And the day he went out to cut the grass, he pulled that lawnmower out, he took that top off, tarp off of it. He said, way! <laughs> anyway, he didn't, you know, but I like to take things apart. So that's how I was in it. I always wanted to understand how things work. And he didn't get upset or anything. He just went out and bought a new lawnmower and told us we could play with that one. But that's so. Uh, now, I had influential teachers when I was in school. I, had, I took Latin in high school, basically because I had to take a foreign language because I knew I wanted to go to college. And Latin was the, you know, I was told that, you know, you learn Latin, you can learn about just about any foreign language. And it was like one of the hardest things I ever did. But I'm glad I took Latin because I understand you know, as far as English words are concerned, you know, how words get developed and everything. So that, what was that? Her name was Mrs. Cooper. She was a Latin teacher. And she was always, she was always telling us that you're gonna regret this one day, that you didn't pay attention and you didn't do your best. She always talked about doing your best. And my mother and father always talked about uh, doing, you know, doing doing that which was right but see i never got lessons in thinking like okay this is how you sit down and this is how you think no i was always told you need to learn how to use your head and you need to learn how to think but nobody ever told me what thinking was and i remember thinking as a child well what is thinking and i got to figure this out but so it's things like that you mentioned earlier the neglected history of um, Holly Springs. Mm -hmm. Could you get into that a little bit? Well, like, for instance, these houses right out here. There's a place right at Walter's, Walter's Place. Yeah, that's the one right across the street. And most of these homes around here, uh, the enslaved people cleared the land, uh, helped the, either designed or helped design the homes, made the bricks, the wrought iron fences, and they were, and it's a very involved process. And what I do is I do a brick making presentation about that, about how many bricks and how long does it take to build a house like that when there are no bulldozers and all you have is labor. So there's that aspect of it. And the, the contribution of the enslaved is not known. The fact that you have free labor in this society, in, in this area where cotton was king. Holly Springs starts in 1832, basically as a town. By the time the Civil War rolls around and, and it's over in 1865, that's only 30 years. Actually, there were enslaved people here, but not necessarily in Holly Springs. And the war, the Civil War is over in Holly Springs when Grant comes in 1861 and he tells basically, those has his soldiers go around and tell the enslaved that, that they're free and they start following, they, the contraband camps spring up and the enslaved people start following the Union Army around. So 
there's this whole uh, cultural environment where people that people don't understand that you have people you have generations of people working for you for free that they receive no benefit but where does the where does the money go where does the you know how does how does the how does that affect everybody in the community well it's true when they say a rising tide floats all ships there were people in uh, in this area that for even some you know the people on that were quote unquote, I don't want to make it sound like slavery wasn't horrible or anything, but there were, there were African Americans, uh, you know, enslaved people who took advantage of the fact of that cotton was king. And there was, there's a story of one guy, uh, Cato Govan, who was, a, who, was a, who was an enslaved person who took cotton to Memphis through Union lines and Confederate lines on his own, he had a team of, of animals and people with him, and he would carry cotton and bring back folks' money. And, he's, and in his, he had a claim, the Southern Claims, uh, where he makes claims after the war, because they, they took his mules and his, his money, his things from him. So we learn his story, and he was saying that he, whatever price he named, he could get that price. He didn't have to negotiate his price. And he's hauling cotton and he's getting paid to do it. Now, nobody knows about a so-called enslaved person. How do you know how to go to Memphis? How do you know how to figure this out? How can he possibly get paid for doing this all on his own? But you don't, so you don't know this. So, and then there's all kinds of relationships that you don't know about in this area amongst the enslaved and the population, whether it's, whether it's the Chickasaw and the Choctaw or the Europeans or whoever the case may be, there's all kinds of relationships that are going on. So, so we don't know this history. So then the more you know about this history, the more you begin to understand how things are the way they are. So we talk about those contributions that, you know, the contributions made by the Africans Americans to the society, whether it be through animal husbandry or through behind the big house that they put on here. When we talk about the contributions of the people that worked in the house, did the cooking, took care of the home, took care of folks, all that. Well, sir, I want to first commend you for your work in educating others about the, the hidden history um, of this town. Um, I'm Patrick, by the way. Uh, one question I do have, uh, going back to the beginning of the interview, I'm very curious about your um, about your second name. Um, how did you di how did you discover this other? That, that's um, it's Senej Ma Karu, and it's uh, it's it's a Kemetic. It's it's Medunetcher, and that is ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs. But the what they call it is Medunetcher, and it means one who is respected and true of voice. But that okay. Uh, some of the first people to write on the earth, or the actual first people to write on the earth, were Africans. In different parts of Africa, there's, uh, if you read anything by Sheikh, Sheikh Anthony Diop, it'll tell you the different parts of Africa and the history and cultural unity is the name of the book. But Africans, they weren't, Africa was not a society, a country, or the different countries in it that were just sitting around waiting for Europeans to come along. That's far from the truth. They had, they had societies, they had uh, people doing things culturally and for eons. And so, and, they, and there was a, there's great wisdom and uh, instructions in how people relate to each other, how people form societies and how it, how it can benefit everybody as opposed to just you know, uh, one group or another to control and have power. Um, I wanted to ask you about if there's any idols you have in American history that kind of exemplify the struggle for human rights. Uh, Ida B. Wells, is, uh, she was born here. That's one person. Uh, Marcus, well, Marcus Garvey wasn't born here, but he came here. Uh, Booker T. Washington, there's several people. 
uh, William Monroe Trotter, folks like uh, Anna Julia Cooper, uh, uh, Francis Allen Harper, Fannie Lou Hamer, uh, Mary McLeod Bethune. Uh, there's, you know, uh, did I say Booker T. Washington, Malcolm X and Martin Luther King? I mean, there's a, there's a whole, but because I, you know, and I don't want to, you know, I'm, I stumbled into this. I wasn't educated into this. So I've, I got a library on my own now. That I that I that I've kept up and I, I I read constantly because it's valuable. So it's people, it's folks like that, uh, and there you know there are others. There's there there are the un there are the unsung uh, heroes that you don't that that you don't hear about. I can't remember, I'm not remembering any names right there. But there's there's folks that. Uh, went to prison and suffered and, you know, had horrible, in horrible conditions, but they managed to keep their humanity intact, which is really what you want to do. You, 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 you can never, you, you can't lose your humanity because that's, it's, that's what makes you human. And if you lose your humanity, uh, it's just about all bets are off. Uh, I want to go a little bit off, off topic here, if that's okay. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us about the day that you met your wife? Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, well, actually, I was going back and forth to these lectures that were going on in Harlem, and my wife used to speak at these lectures. Now, she's a completely different person. Her entire upbringing, she spent uh, you know, in the library she spent years in the library reading about African history, reading about different uh, African-American culture, black culture, lots of things. And so she's the, she knows uh, the ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs that I was interested in, and I took a class, and that's how we met. And then one thing led to another. I had to, I had, I asked her, well, she, she had a lecture that she had to give, come give in New Jersey and I asked her if I could uh, bring her over to New Jersey for the lecture so that's how we that's how we met and that's how our relationship started. This is Alexandra so in terms of educating people about the history of African American you know their legacies what kind of changes have you seen in the community over the course of your life or since you started your advocacy? Okay well uh, Television, superheterodyne theory is a great thing, provided you can get the right kind of programming. See, and well, again, it goes back to people make the programs. It's got nothing to do with superheterodyne theory, but the, the, the fact that you know you have radio and television, and then the internet is a great thing. The internet's one of the, the amount, the, the amount of information that you have access to today, if I had the same access to information and when I was in high school in the 70s, we were still using, I, w I learned how to use a slide rule. Calculators were just becoming popular. But the internet is you know, wonderful information. However, the thing about the internet is, as you know, anybody can put anything out there. And the information is not always beneficial or in the best interest of society as a whole. And then you have folks that block the information. So using you, but using technology to uh, communicate with people is a great thing because uh, we have to, the, the internet and the technology is going to allow for people to come up to, come up to snuff, for lack of a better word, rather quickly, rather than educating the whole country without it. <laughs> Uh, this is Patrick again. Um, sir, uh, you mentioned that you uh, uh, constantly read. Can you mention some of your favorite books um, and some of the books that you're currently reading? Okay, there's a book right now I'm reading called Three Mothers. I forget the, uh, the author's name right now, but she talks about the mothers of uh, Malcolm X, uh, 
Elijah Muhammad, and who's the third one? Is it King? Yeah, Martin Luther King. She, she talks about their mothers, and nobody had ever written, nobody had took this subject from, you know, how does, how, how, do, how does motherhood or the raising by your mother affect how you get these three gentlemen or other, or other you know, aspects of it? So there's that book. Uh, I read a book recently that comes to mind called, uh, it's about Wilmington, North Carolina. I'm, I'm getting the title right now. But Wilmington, North Carolina and the particular uh, racial situation in North Carolina uh, after uh, 1865 and how they basically women they just uh, the, the the how can you put this this not Nazis at the time but uh, white supremacists just took over the government wholesale I mean they just slaughtered people basically and ran the, the elected government of uh, the coalition government out of the society uh, I'm reading another book uh, that I just finished reading uh, by uh, I Quay Armour. Uh, he's a, uh, he's not, well, he's in Senegal right now, but he's an African author. And he, he, uh, one, of, one of his most famous books that I've read is 2000 Seasons, which is uh, now, if you read that, yeah, it's what you bring to it that counts because most, most folks, they get to the first four or five pages and they can't, you, you have to bring something to it to be able to get it. Uh, there's another book that I'm reading. Man, I don't know why it's not coming to me now. I just finished, I just finished reading that one. Oh, it's by uh, Wole, Wole Swanka. He's another African author. And uh, I'm reading books. Uh, I picked up a couple books by uh, Amos Wilson, which, who is an uh, African-American psychologist who passed away back in the uh, late 90s. Are there, uh, just to follow up on this, Christian, just to follow up on that, are there any books or even works of art, like music or film, that you think really like inspired you or influenced you throughout your life? Oh, wow. That's a good question. What films? Well, you know, like Booker T. Washington's Up From Slavery or Vincent Harding's There Is a River. Those were a couple of the first books I'd read. I've read the autobiography of Malcolm X. Uh, Movies, uh, I can just, well, there's one movie, uh, my, it's a, this is a small independ, uh, independent film that my brother just uh, made with one of his friends that we all, all went to the same high school. It's called uh, Pitch Vine Entertainment, and the movie just came out, and the name of the, f the film escapes me. But it's pitch vine entertainment. It's got to do with the uh, the Fifth Amendment and the Thirteenth Amendment, and that basically the movie charges that uh, the, they they take the country. One of the things that Malcolm X was going to do was going to take the country to the UN and charge genocide. Well, they make a movie about charging the, the United States and the World Court as far as the not not. Uh, What's the word? Enforcing the fifth and the fourteenth, the thirteenth amendment. But I forget the name of the film right now. This is Alexandra. I was interested in the first Thanks. book you mentioned about the three mothers. So relating to that, how would you describe like the influence or have you seen women in activism throughout your career, like mothers, sisters, anyone really? Okay, well. And any, anybody that, uh, my mother was very influential in my life. And her mother was very influential in your life. You can turn on any sports program in America, and the first thing you're going to see, you know, the black guys are going to, hi, mom. You know, that's what, they, that's, that's, that, that's what they do. And, and a lot of guys do it. But uh, the influence of, uh, African American women in this country. Matter of fact, one of the best books that you can read about this is by uh, Paula Giddings, and it's called When and Where I Enter. 
and it's about the history of African American women uh, in this country from like 1865 to 1970, Paula Giddings. And basically, it comes down to some of the first unions in this country were formed by uh, African American women. They formed their union, the Washington women formed unions to protect themselves and for their wages. And then they, were they protecting themselves? They were protecting themselves from the abuse, the sexual abuse that they were receiving in the homes that they were working in from the, the men that were there. So they formed unions because, and, and then they weren't getting paid. So they formed some of the first unions in this country. Uh, the, 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 you know, the black church is, the, the first churches that were formed, the, the women play in a very important role in this formation. Uh, and when I talk about, oh, that's what I didn't mention, it, uh, Maria Stewart uh, and other, uh, what's this woman's name? Now, it's not, it's not coming to me right now. But uh, the women are always influential, but they, don't get the, but they don't get the story told. And that's, that's see, the, well, that's another, see, that's, that's, that's another. Uh, this, this, the understanding of things here in this, we live in a quote unquote patriarchal society. So, you know, if you know anything about patriarchy, it's the rule of the father. And so, therefore, in a patriarchal society, the first, one of the first rules is that you don't want to be challenged by the other men in the society, but also in that society is the, how, how women get affected. And that's one of the reasons why women don't get to vote till 1921, 1920. And, it, and it's, it's, it's just crazy how things worked out here. But to answer your question, yeah, the African women, they're always there, and they, but their story is very, very seldom told. Um, if none of my colleagues have any more questions, uh, just to wrap up, is there any uh, kind of closing thought you have or any, any anecdote or story you want to tell for the record that you think is important? Yeah, I do, and that is this. And uh, in a society, it is very important that you understand the time that you live in. And I didn't realize this one. You don't realize this when you're a child. But where, when, you're, when you're born and what you have an opportunity to participate in a society, uh, each generation has an opportunity to make the society and make the world that they want to live in. How you, how you do that is by, you know, working together, compromising, for lack of a better word, and, but you have to know what it is you're compromising about. You have to be aware of what's going on around you. Uh, it, it says in the Husea, a wise man is one who knows what's going on around them. You have to be aware of what's going on so that you can make decisions in your, in your own self-interest, but also in the self-interest of that benefits everyone. Because if you live a block from me and you can't feed your family, and I can feed mine. It's not going to be long before you find your way to my house. Okay? And it's the same thing with nations. If you don't have, if people over here are starving and they don't have water and health care, and, and this nation does, when people get up and start walking because of uh, conflicts for whatever reason. Throughout history, it's, it's, uh, it's migration and immigration that, that, that is the downfall of societies. And so solving them problems is, you know, people being aware of what's going on around them and making decisions in the best interest of everyone, not just those who want to have control. So that's what I want to, you know, say. On behalf of all of us here in the Samuel Proctor Oral History Program at the University of Florida, thank you so much for taking the time for us. Thank you. Appreciate it. Is there
Sorry. Wayne Jones. Wayne Jones. Wayne Jones. Or. All right, I'll write it down. And okay. also, I go by, uh, my birth name is Wayne Jones, but I'm also known as Sinej Ma Karu. You're also known as Kisaki Sinej Ma Karu. Sinej Ma Karu. Yes. Can you spell that for me? Uh, I'll spell it with vowels. S E N. D E J, that's Sinej. Ma is M A A, and Karu is K E R U. Okay. Where does that, where does it's, that name come from? It's, uh, it's Medunetra. It's ancient Egyptian. Okay. They didn't use any vowels, so you, you actually spell it without the vowels, and phonetically it would be S N D J, M R M for Ma. M A what the vowel sound and Karu is K R U, but it you know they they had symbols they didn't use alphabet so that's the closest you can get but it means one who is respected and true of voice respected and true of voice one who is respected and true of voice true of voice well that's what we need from you today well I have no reason to lie hopefully. <laughs>